The idea here is instead of acting with an agenda from the beginning, best to not assert yourself, not impose your ordering on the world, but act in response to the world. Um, the Lao Tzu has a set of formulas that suggest what this involves. Do that which consists in taking no action. Pursue that which is not meddlesome. Savor that which has no flavor. Lay plans for the accomplishment of the difficult before it becomes difficult. Make something big by starting with it when small. It is because a sage never attempts to be great that he succeeds in becoming great. There's certainly many uh, paradoxes in that particular passage. And this, too, I think, points to this idea of the via negativa, trying to figure out, well, what could possibly be meant by saying, because the sage isn't trying to be great, the sage becomes great. Well, what the sage does do is avoid asserting an agenda, really aiming at something that's going to require forcing everything else in your environment to fall into place. Um, really pushing your agenda is almost always a way not to get the world to cooperate with you. You might think of this interpersonally. Sometimes if you have an idea that you express too strongly, it makes others, in a sense, kind of shy away from it. And maybe they would have been perfectly willing to go along with it if you hadn't come on so strong. Um, I met a man once who had been legally dead for 14 minutes. And he said that it hadn't, in some ways, changed his life as much as one might expect. But the big change was that after this experience, he didn't feel like forcing the issue so much anymore. Um, he's a businessman, and he mentioned the fact that um, although he still made deals, he waited for things to fall into place more and then closed the deal when it seemed that the time was right to do it, instead of doing all kinds of things to manipulate things to kind of force the issue when he wanted it to happen. This would be the Taoist conception here. Um, don't have an agenda that you're going to force on experience. Be constantly attuning yourself to experience. I think dancing might be another uh, metaphor that can help us to see what's involved here. If you learn to dance, say, in a dance class, and then attempt to dance with a partner in some context, it may be that what you're going to be thinking about, first of all, is now, which foot do I start with? What is the basic move? And so on. In a sense, that's dancing. But as long as you're thinking about that, it's not really dancing in the sense of being graceful. And the Taoist conception of the best way to live is to be graceful with the flow of all events. So it's not as though you're passive in the sense of tuning everything out. Quite the contrary, you're attentively perceiving everything and responding subtly at every moment. So to say it's non-action is not really the best translation. But to say non-assertive action, I think, is a good way of understanding Wu Wei. We're acting, but we're acting in response and in accordance with everything that's around us. The Tao Te Ching um, sometimes talks about this in terms of a mystical union uh, with the rhythms of the world. One of the intriguing things about the Tao Te Ching is that it's been viewed as a manual for all kinds of different purposes. Some people see it as a manual that mainly has to do with mystical experience. It's been used as a medical manual um, with its emphasis on sustaining life, etc. And interestingly enough, even though those sound like very um, unworldly kinds of activities, it's also been seen as a very um, pointed set of ad ad advisories to people who actually are political leaders. Again, a theme that we've noticed before in the case of Shunza, the idea in Taoism is that for someone to really be a good leader involves exactly this policy of Wu Wei. A good ruler doesn't have to force the issue constantly. I mean, that does nothing but get a lot of people um, to be antagonistic toward the ruler's goal. The best ruler is someone who doesn't have to do anything that's very aggressive, but instead assesses the situation and allows things to move with only very subtle intervention, if that. In the Tao Te Ching, we see the following passage. The best of all rulers is but a shadowy presence to his subjects. When his task is accomplished and his work done, the people all say, 
it happened to us naturally. That's a kind of extreme um, political goal that I don't think too many of the contemporary spin doctors would be too happy about it. A uh, political spin doctor generally thinks that people in politics should take credit where credit is due, maybe even <laughs> where it isn't. Uh, but certainly you want credit. This vision is that, no, if you're looking for credit, um, you're not really dealing with the situation of being a ruler in the best way. The best ruler is one that allows things to move as they will, intervening only very reluctantly uh, when it's absolutely necessary. But an intelligent ruler is one who has arranged things in such a way and is responsive to the needs of the people, so much so that nobody's even aware that any policies have been put into place. So if people think, oh yeah, this just kind of naturally happened, um, and don't give credit to the ruler, this could be an indication that the ruler was actually doing the best of possible jobs. The notion of um, Wu Wei also includes the notion of being objective. Now, this is not objectivity in the Western sense of trying to figure out what reality is independent of any point of view. Of course, we always have a point of view, and the Taoists in particular would be uh, emphasizing that fact. If we're talking about vitality as it flows through us, we're certainly talking from a point of view. But objectivity here, again, has to do with attuning oneself to the world, recognizing what the situation of, of the world is, and then responding to that. So instead of trying to uh, coming into any situation with your own ideas of how things ought to be, allowing things to uh, take the, the shape that they do. When I first heard the expression, go with the flow, I thought of this in a very mystical kind of sense, until I got to LA and tried to drive on the freeways there. And then I thought, it's no surprise that this got to be so popular in California. You have to go with the flow if you're going to go at all. And I think that the kind of state of mind that leads to road rage is exactly the kind of thing that the Taoists point out is always brewing as long as we're insistent on forcing our agenda on our situation. Certainly, if you're stuck in LA traffic, not moving very fast, it's possible to be very frustrated by that. I can get frustrated by that with much less traffic just if I hit a few red lights, one, one red light too many, and I think, oh no, I'm not going to be able to do this errand I was planning on doing. The Taoists would say, forget the errand. The errand maybe isn't that important. Um, it's more important to respond to exactly what's going on. And having an agenda is a sure way of making one feel um, out of sorts with one's environment. But what's really essential is to become attuned to one's environment. Even Chinese military thought emphasizes this idea of using the environment to enhance one's own abilities rather than trying to force your will on the environment. So for instance, locating oneself, um, fortifying your position on top of a hill, say, um, is a good thing to do because the environment will do some of the work for you. If people are going to charge the hill, that's going to take a lot of work and it might very well expose them. Um, you can use gravity to a certain extent roll down logs, I mean, a kind of old-fashioned, traditional military technique. These sorts of things indicate that the environment can move with you as long as you're responsive to it. But what won't work is you're imposing your will on the environment. We'll have more to say about this in the next lecture.